the Council of Kenwood, and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Christopher Woodward. He's currently director of the Garden Museum, um, which he has been since 2006. He was previously director of the Hoban Museum in Bath. He's performed wonders at the Garden Museum, um, restoring the ancient church where the museum is situated. There's a new extension for education. It's a cafe built around a Dan Pearson garden. He's also published, and his books include In Ruins, um, 2001, and he's a very competitive swimmer. This talk is called A Paradise of Pollen and Paint, the Story of Benton End. Benton End in 2021 was majority gifted to the Garden Museum. It's situated in Hadley in Suffolk, and it's the former home of the celebrated artist and gardener, Sir Cedric Morris, and the artist, Arthur Lett Haynes. So if we can sit back, we'll learn a bit more about Benton End. Thank, thank you for asking me, because we're at that stage of the project where, I'll, I'll say at the end, it's going very well, particularly in the garden, but um, you have stops and starts, and it's very nice to sit down with the books about Cedric and be reminded of what it's all for, what the glue is, as people say, why, why, why are we doing this project and what atmosphere we're trying to bring back to this, this house, which the phrase, a paradise of pollen and paint was... Uh, in an essay by Ronald Blythe called The Iris Master, which is a very beautiful piece of writing about his friendship with, with Cedric Morris. I've never, ever given a talk with a child before, and I've done, I don't know, hundreds. And um, so I'm embarrassed slightly. Um, my my wife's father's fine, but he was in intensive care till last week, so she's gone to Brighton to look after him, and we couldn't get a babysitter. So this is Max, who's drawing happily. And um, I'm embarrassed also because um, Benton End was an Arcadia, and perhaps that's something we can talk about at the end, but an Arcadia is defined by what it excludes. Someone compares Arcadia to a bell jar where the pressure within is achieved by the thickness of the glass around it. And Cedric didn't like children. And um, he just, there are no children in the photographs at Benton End. And when we did an exhibition on Lucian Freud, who was perhaps his most, well, who was certainly his most famous pupil, uh, one of the most inspiring contributors to that exhibition was Annie Freud, his eldest daughter, who's a very, very good poet. And she she would describe how um, Freud's mother moved to Wolverswick at the end of her life. And Benton End is just outside a small town called Hadley. It's in what's called Constable Country. It's a very pretty river valley. A stream runs through the garden. That runs into the valley, which runs into, into the River Brett, which runs into the River Colne, which is Constable's River. So Dedham is about 10, 10 miles away. And so Lucian Freud would stop off at Benton End on the way to Wolverswick because Annie said that he knew there would be an argument with his mother when he arrived and he wanted to postpone the argument. And he would sit with Cedric in the garden. But the first time she said, Cedric looked at her and said, who is that awful child? And he said, that's my daughter. So um, then then, then we'll, we'll come back to Freud, but then they would spend time sitting in the walled garden talking nobody knows what's about. Uh, Freud went to Benton End when he was 16. And it was a very unusual relationship for Lucy and Freud. It was one of the calmest of his life. It was very equal, unusually equal. And they had something very deep between them, which continued until Cedric's death in the 1980s. So I am going to talk about it's really Benton End was an artist community which began in 1939. And uh, petered out in the 1970s. Arthur Lett Haynes died in 1978. Cedric died four years later, both in the winter, both in Ipswich Hospital. And uh, I, when you were at Benton End, you were divided into Cedric people and Lett people. Maggie Hambling, who is perhaps the last famous pupil, she arrived when she was a teenager. She was born in the town, was a Lett person. And her art has been described by Richard Morford as um, uh, metamorphic in the sense she was about change inner beings. And that was what Let Haynes' work was about. He was a surrealist. His art is quite non-figurative. It's quite disturbing at times. And uh, she she was immediately drawn to Let, who she was very close to. Other people were Cedric people. And uh, I. it's a bit like those, when you see those football matches and it says percentage of possession, um, you're probably gonna get about 78% Cedric possession because I feel I understand Cedric a little better than than Let. But in a sense, the house was about these two two people and their different personalities. And I think this is this is this is what you have to picture. It's uh, a Tudor house 
with a Georgian front above that river valley. It had been a farmhouse till the 1920s when it was bought by one of the Sainsbury family, one of the uh, children of uh, the founder of Sainsbury's. He was in charge of the dry goods section. He had bought a country house at Leyham, which is the the next village and he wanted more land for shooting so he bought it as a shooting it's about three acres of farmland of of land and he bought it for the shooting and it was it was empty had been empty for more than 10 years by the time Cedric Lett and the art school came and I wanted really to begin with um one 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 eyewitness account but first of all to explain why we're here the first person who I mean the first person I mean how how many people had heard of Cedric Morris five ten years ago yeah, yeah, Lynn, yeah. Um, but he's he's had um this astonishing revival in both the horticultural world and in the um art world. Uh in the horticultural world, thinking of what you said, Pat, about the spring the snowdrops. The last article I wrote about him was uh, for Country Life about when he died, he appointed a plant executor. Uh she was called Jenny Robinson, and a plant executor is quite a rare thing. It's quite a hard thing. It's harder than being any other kind of executor because you're given a collection of plants and you have to find people who are going to look after the plants, know what they're doing, and then pass them on to someone else. And uh, Cedric Cedric had many friends such as John Morley, the great snowdrop person who flourishes today. But uh, one of them, there was a famous figure in Essex who was called, um, who was who was a great snowdrop expert but was also known as the nicking vicar and i wasn't allowed to put it in country life or the reverend takeaway because he was he 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 um and as this is live streamed i can't say his name but he 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 was discovered some you know the, the spring after cedric's death in the garden by millie hayes who was the housekeeper basically stealing the snowdrops with putting them into a carrier bag and she had to threaten to write to his bishop uh to say he 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 so, so, um, so, 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 Cedric has had this astonishing revival both in the horticultural world and in the art world. A piece in the Telegraph about four years ago presented some graphs and suggested that his prices had risen more quickly than any other 20th century artist. And this began with the sale of David Bowie's collection. David Bowie had a small collection of Cedric Morris, but uh, as we'll see, has been also a consequence of a number of exhibitions. The next one of which is at Gainsborough's house in Sudbury, opening on the 4th of July. But I first heard about him in two ways. First of all, from Beth Chateau. Beth Chateau was his great horticultural protégé. And she, when, when she speaks about, she talks about the two men in her life. One was her husband, Andrew Chateau, who was a botanist and a, and a fruit farmer. But when she spoke about Cedric, uh, this is a little film on our website, you can find it. Her voice would... Her whole face would change colour. She was just completely in love with him. She adored him. And she said her life as a gardener really began when she was brought along. Beth was um, very, uh, she married when she was very young. She had two daughters. Her husband was from quite a rich family. He had bought this farm. He was an academic. And she was used to being sort of dragged along around gardens by by men using lots of um, botanical names and Cedric was the first person who said it was very tall was just under six foot who turned to her and sort of took her as an equal and chatted to her and she said that really um, and led her through the garden talking about his favorite plants and, and she he then she would then go to him for advice and one day she said I want to make a garden and he's first of all you must move house so he told her to leave where she lived and go to the new site which is Great Elmstead where you have the garden today but she 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 described the garden as a great whirling tapestry of rare plants which we'll come back to but she was she talked about um she um she she yes yeah, so, so Beth would um talk about Cedric in in these glowing terms and the other thing at the same time this would have been about 2010 I came across this painting here of Poppets and I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. And it was actually offered as a gift to the Garden Museum. But then in the nicest possible way, as prices continued to rise, the the gift changed from, it it sort of (laughs) tipped away slightly. So the very nice family um, whose father had bought it actually at Arthur Tooth in 1928, um, they became a friend of the Garden Museum. Uh, But uh, that's that's, that's hanging in the house of, a great admirer of Cedric. He he painted that in the late 1920s and it's a poppy which Beth collected from Benton End and which he still sells. It's the, it's the Papava Cedric Morris. And it's a very blotchy red purply poppy. It's really beautiful when you, it, it's got touches of gray in it. And Cedric would have got that poppy by selective weeding. 
he, each year he would have returned to the poppy beds or where poppies grew and he would have weeded out all the bright red ones looking for the poppies that were slightly damaged slightly blotchy because he was yeah effectively by weeding he was he was breeding these gray purple poppies which are yeah they're 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 uh yeah and 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 one of one of cedric's mementos so we did two we did an exhibition in 2018 we had just opened the museum after a big construction project and that coincided with an exhibition that philip mold the gallerist did in his gallery on st james's on bond street sorry um what's it called where the clubs are um and that was an exhibition about cedric's travels because cedric would travel as a young man he traveled every winter and i've i've been doing all this fundraising stuff since i was 22 working on different museums and things really never happen like this but a couple called rob and bidget pinchbeck who were new to cedric came to see the exhibitions they were patrons of the garden museum friends of philip mold and they uh philip gave a talk at the museum one night and the pinchbecks found themselves sitting next to the couple who lived there and they were talking about that and they said oh we were selling up because the kids have moved away it's a big house there's seven bedrooms uh and and the sale fell through and the pinchbecks bought it within a couple of weeks with really the intention of returning it to public access they live in oxfordshire it wasn't anything they haven't even asked for their name to be put anywhere it's completely altruistic so it is a bit of a fairy tale we have to at some point as part of the fundraising find three hundred fifty thousand pounds which is about a fifth of its commercial value and that's really to replenish parts of their charity which work uh, particularly with eyesight and other medical causes but it's quite remarkable to be suddenly uh standing there with with the keys to this house when you know 10 years after with a friend we just sort of peered over over the garden wall and wondered what it was like that's one of his iris paintings from the mid 1930s and the other thing that happened in this time was sarah cook now sarah cook is a brilliant speaker and she can give an astonishing talk on cedric's irises this is her in her garden which is in the next village she lives with somebody called jim marshall who's the great expert on pinks he was the deputy head of gardens at the national trust and they're both on our gardens committee. She, um, uh, Sarah actually grew up in Hadley and she remembers going to Benton End for the Red Cross teas with her mother. And there's a little black and white photograph of her sitting in one of the borders. And then she became a gardener. She was the head gardener at Sissinghurst. And one day she saw in a border an iris, a bearded iris, and was struck by its beautiful color. And she said, where did that come from? And they said, that must be a Benton iris. They're called Benton irises. And that led her to the whole story of, well, Vita Sackville West was a great friend of Cedric. She would go, he had these iris days. Hundreds of people would come, park in the field and wander through this field of irises. Vita would never stay in the house because it was too messy. And she, she, um, she would stay in a pub called the King's Arms, which is on Hadley High Street. And that iris would have made its way to Sissinghurst from one of those... Irish days. And so Sarah began this research project. From the 1940s, Cedric was publishing each year his new Irish varieties. He bred about 2,000 seedlings each winter. And it really is like mixing paints. You're effectively mixing the pollen of different irises to come up with different colours. And he would throw away the great majority, but he named about 90 varieties. And he named them after friends, lovers, pets. And Sarah has now found in her garden about 30 of these. She's been as far as Switzerland. There was some in Botanic Garden. She's on her way to Canada. And so she's she has tracked down about 30 out of 90 of the Benton irises. And they've become a bit of a cult. I don't know if any people, if on Instagram in the last few years, Benton irises have become this big, this big, this big wave. Uh, they, they flower for a short time, obviously. They flower around the time of the Chelsea Flower Show. And Sarah did a display in the Grand Marquis, whatever it's called, the Big Tent in 2015. And it was just a display of Benton irises. And it was an absolute knockout. People were sort of melting. It was um, a whole crowd gathered. And that, that the irises, the paintings, uh, began this revival of interest in Cedric Morris. And here, that's Sarah on the steps, um, Rob Pinchbeck and his wife, Bridget, uh, below and then Philip Mould um, celebrating the handing over the keys to the house. But to go back in time, I wanted really, um, there's a lot written about Benton End. So um, that's, 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 um, I, I, I wanted to sort of give you a sense of what made it so special. 
and this this is this is um, a lot of what we do. We have an archive at the Garden Museum of gardens because gardens change so quickly, and a lot is recording. And this book called Benton End Remembered is really this is the book that makes you fall in love with Benton End because it was assembled in the early 1990s as a collection of reminiscences, and one of 20 or 30 of the students um, who I've chosen here is Glyn Morgan. And that's a self-portrait of Glyn Morgan uh, from, uh, I think, the late 1940s. And he met Cedric in South Wales. Now, Cedric was born in Swansea in 1889. He was born at a house called Sketty Hall. And his family were industrialists back to the 18th century. One of his ancestors was partly responsible for building Dulwich Picture Gallery. And his uh, after 200 years of iron founding and coal mining, his father was a country gentleman. He played rugby for Wales, he shot, they lived in a country house. His mother was a Cory, a great horticultural family. So Cedric was an aristocrat. He became baronet in 1947. And he had a great social conscience. He was a socialist. He uh, quite, um, one of the stories told is of how there was a great event in Hadley because he would vote for the Hadley, he would vote Labour in the general election and the Labour Party would send a car to come and collect him. So this was a great event because um, the local baronet voting and um, he had he had a particularly, he was an early environmentalist as we'll see, but he had a particularly strong social conscience for Wales. And um, here's one of his paintings set in the Gower Peninsula, which was very much his, his heart home and one of his paintings of industrial South Wales. And from the 1930s, he went to South Wales to do, at that time you had 98% un, uh, unemployment in Merthyr Tidfil, it's unimaginable. And he went to teach courses to the unemployed. We did this in the 90s, it was called Art for the Unemployed, it was a thing, it still continues, it's very rewarding, but Cedric was doing this in the 1930s. And he went to teach in a town called Pontypridd. And one of those buildings there is called the Pontypridd Settlement, where he would uh, arrive. And much of his teaching was about the practicalities. He was very good at explaining how to stretch a canvas, how to mix your paints. But he taught unemployed miners art. But that's where he met Glyn Morgan, who, whose father, Glyn Morgan's grandfather was a coal miner. His father worked for the railways in a you know an office position. And, he's, and this is Glyn Morgan. My father said, you're quite good with your hands. Why don't you become a garage mechanic? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but he didn't want to be. He wanted to be an artist. And he says, in 1943, I met Cedric Morris. He liked my pictures and invited me to visit Benton End. I booked a week for the following summer and my life was changed. So this is 1944. The East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. Let's see if we've got a... Um, there we are. That is a photograph in Country Life from 1943 or four showing the iris beds, that's Benton End there, you would see, of course. The East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing, as Benton End was rather grandly called, was a large, shabby Tudor house just outside Hadley, set in a very large garden full of horticultural treasures. I vividly remember my first evening there. A large, scarred and studded, this is the kitchen, we'll put them, that's them. A large, scarred and studded zinc-covered table stood on the uneven brick floor. That was actually from Hills, all their furniture, their kitchen furniture was all quite chic. It was all bought in Hills in the early 1930s. On the table, an enormous pot of irises echoed a painting now in Tate Britain, that painting there, uh, of the same size on the wall. The air was heavy with the pungent scent of the flowers and the room roared with conversation and laughter. To a young man from the Welsh Valleys, the whole place was exotic and exciting. I think that this feeling of everything being larger than life was the main, one of the main differences between Benton End and other summer schools. It was a world apart where painting was the most important thing in life. There were no formal classes. You started a picture in the studio or in the garden, and after a while, Cedric would amble up, his hands earthy, filling a foul old pipe from a battered ivory tobacco, tobacco box. He never told anyone to use a particular technique. His criticisms were confined to the colors, the balance, really him trying to understand what you were trying to get out of painting. Arthur Lett Haynes, known always as Lett, would also comment. His approach was more intellectual and he usually managed to contradict Cedric. Between the two of them, we learned a lot. And Lett had put his own painting aside in order to manage the house and look after Cedric. He was large and intimidating, malicious and warm-hearted, and he produced two tremendous mills every day to the accompaniment of loud and eloquent complaints and scurrilous comments on everyone he could think of. 
There was wine with both mills, and after lunch, everyone but the most determined workers staggered upstairs to sleep. Let retired to his room and was not seen again until the evening, while Cedric often curled up in a flower bed. The students usually prepared tea at about 4.30 p.m. and then um, went back out into the garden, and there's a cowbell that we've been given. And just before dinner time, someone went round with this cowbell, which Cedric had bought prep from Switzerland, and rang the bell, and everyone came in to dinner. And um, he continues to say, um, what, what, there were two things unique about the school. Cedric had been taught in the academies of Paris before the First World War, and they were free academies. You turned up, you could come and go. Uh, there was much less, it was, it was called Academy Libre. You had, um, the, the, it wasn't like the Slade, where there was very much a house school, a didactic dominant voice. It's one of the reasons that Freud left the Central School of Art, left Artington and came to, to Benton End. You were, the idea of Benton End was to be free in your own artistic personality. So that was one thing that was distinctive. The second thing was that it was for all ages and it combined, you could go for a few months or, or you were mixed in with quite a few older people who might have another profession like Sir Peter Wakefield, who was the great chair of the art fund, was an ambassador. He would go there each summer. Uh, you had um, um, the young, this is Glyn Morgan. I remember Glyn Morgan's still a teenager. He says, at one time, there was a plague of psychoanalysts who covered the whole spectrum of behavior from the lightly intellectual to the downright crazy. One who frequently threatened suicide was known as Gassup and Kate. Everyone had a nickname, their nickname invented by Lett. There was hot-handed Hetty or the royal bum. And um, the, the, so, but, you, you, so you would mix with these older, wiser people and another pupil describes arriving for her first night and they go out after dinner into the garden where there's a bonfire and these two men in white tie drift in and it was Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce back from a concert and someone picked up a guitar and they just sang. So I think that's what you have to imagine is that captivating atmosphere. And it was intended to be equal. There was that degree of, as said, I think a nickname does two things. It makes people feel welcome, but it also excludes people who don't have a nickname. So there were certainly people who didn't fit, but if you did fit, you were welcome for life. The, um, he goes on to talk about the irises. That's the kitchen. The kitchen sink was quite famous. We found that in the garden, covered in, uh, buried and covered in tiles. It was famously dirty. He describes, he said, um, the sink had to be seen to be believed. It was seldom empty and dreadful slimy dishcloths lurked at the bottom of it. Um, the wooden draining board had a spongy texture, um, but it is doubtful if this was a greater danger to health than the wooden plates, old and warped, also from hills, and no doubt pulsating with germs. Luckily, Brian Brook, a celebrated proctologist, was a frequent student and was on hand to distribute quantities of Lomatil. I didn't know what a proctologist was until recently, but it's about the bottom, the colon. And um, wonders of Wikipedia, Brian Brooke wrote the classic of the troubled gut of 1961. So, um, but he he was the one with the chemicals. So, so that was that was, and then you can see this is um this room is better recorded than others. You can see their medicines, their bottles, and that leaded window critters looks into the garden. The house was Elizabethan, it was the big house in Hadley, built in 1520. Uh, the um, this is perhaps the finest room to survive inside with the Elizabethan panelling. And this was the bedroom that Lett chose when they moved in 1939. And he chose it partly because one window looks out over the garden, one looks out over the driveway. And Lett liked to know what was going on. There's another story that uh, Glyn Morgan tells of how there was one telephone and he was rumoured to listen in to the conversations. And Glyn Morgan's wife was coming to see him and he was giving her directions and said, turn right at the crossroads. And this voice said, left! So, um, but, uh, and that is the room in which Maggie Hamlin painted a great picture of Lett at the very end of his life. And um, so that's, that's really the atmosphere of Benton End. A little more about Cedric and their earlier lives because it was called the artist's house. Ronnie Blythe said there was a dangerous whiff of garlic. And you have to imagine how exotic and exciting, as Glyn said, it was for 1940s Suffolk. This is a self-portrait of the late 1920s. So Cedric in his 30s, born in 1889, as said, born into an aristocratic family. He went to school at Charterhouse. He came bottom in pretty much everything and was going to become a singer, uh, didn't pass his exams. He went off to Canada to become a farmer. We know that from various um, ticket stubs. We know the name of the liner. 
He then uh, was a lift boy in New York and came back and went to those academies in Paris. This was something shared with me recently by Patrick Beatty, who is the expert on historic paint, but also on the artist rifles. And these are the, um, this is from August, 1914. And this tells you, um, I've just moved to here. Um, this, these are the enrollment records. Cedric was one of 5,000 people to volunteer for the artist rifles in, in the first, in, in August, 1914 only 570 were accepted, which um, uh, shows that he was fit and competent. But you can see he was um, 24 and eight months. He was five foot 11 and three quarters. He was 36 inches across in the chest. And his experience was uh, Charterhouse Rifle Corps. And then in March, showing when and how the volunteer quitted the corps, he was discharged before Christmas. As a child, he had had damage to his, his ear and they realized that he, um, his eardrum would burst if he was near the sound of shells. So he was given the job of working. He was a great, a very good rider. He was given the job of working for the remounts where effectively horses were brought um, in from the countryside and you had to train them up for the front. Um, you had to, whatever the phrase is, um, make them easily rideable. And um, Let Haynes had fought in the First World War. He had a great scar across his brow and they met on Armistice Night in 1918. Lett was married, he was having a party at his house in Chelsea, and they lived together ever afterwards. They first of all went to Newlyn in Cornwall. There you had the light in the morning, St Ives over the peninsula, you had the light in the afternoon. They went to live in Paris, they went to Italy, they had an exhibition just when the fascists took over Rome. So they lived at all the sharp angles of modernism. They were in Hemingway Circle in, well, they weren't in Hemingway Circle. I first came across them without realizing because they uh, appear in one of the scenes in Hemingway's first novel, The Sun Also Rises, but in a way that's quite nasty. Uh, Hemingway um, is what we would call homophobic. The, he describes them dancing, that Let, Let is named in that novel. And they were both friends with somebody called Duff Twisden, who Hemingway was unsuccessfully in love with. That is then probably at some point in the 1930s, they loved animals. They always had a set, that's, he's called Rubio, he's a parrot. And even from the 1920s in Paris, Cedric would have a hair in his studio, parrots. This is uh, some postcards from that time. Cedric, they had other lovers and Cedric's, one of Cedric's other lovers was Paul Odo Cross, who comes back into our story. And this is a set of postcards. It's a bit unfair on that actually, because they, Paul Odo Cross was rich. His, um, his father was a colonel, his mother was an American heiress. He was a ballet dancer and he would take Cedric on these holidays and they're writing to Let in Paris, commiserating with him having the mumps. So he must be, must be thoroughly fed up that they were sending him postcards from the south of France while he was lying abandoned in, in Paris. And they came back to London, lived on Brook Street, had great parties. They announced in 1930, there's an invitation, it's called the End of the World Party. And you had to dress for the end of the world. At the bottom rather nicely, it says BYOB, BYOB which I haven't seen for years since I was bring your own bottle which was apparently a bright young thing it started in the 1920s BYOB and so they had this great party but then Cedric wanted to live in the countryside and they went first to a house called the Pound which Cedric was given by um, an artist friend uh, he was lent it and then bequeathed it and that is about eight miles from Benton End they arrived in 1930 and they painted and began to make a garden this is this is much of this garden still survives. Cedric probably planted it. Uh, it's a garden in a valley, sloping like Benton End. Uh, we went there with our patrons last summer. There's some of the structure left. And in Philip, Philip, this is where, in Philip Mould's view, he painted the greatest of his paintings, such as that Irish painting you saw earlier. But they needed money, and that's why they set up an art school. It was Let's idea. So they set up the East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. It opened in 1937, and some students stayed here but the others, um, it was in, it was in, um, they, they, they rented uh, basically a room above a pub in Dedham. And that's where the first students came. This is uh, also at the Pound. That's a little studio in the garden. It's still got all his brush marks and that's him with parrot and dog. You can see how he was always beautifully dressed, Cedric. He was quite effective. He always wear a beautiful scarf, corduroy. There was something soft and crumpled and he had very fine features. People talked about his hands, his voice. Let, Let was quite menacing looking. He, he, he was dressy, he wore spats, he wore darker clothes, he wore a sharp tie. They were quite, but Cedric was all soft and crumpled and 
and um, quieter, mischievous. He would chuckle and let would tell the stories. This is um, Dedham. That's Lucian Freud, one of the first batch of pupils on the right. That's somebody called David Carr on the left. And what happened one night is that those two and um, a Chinese model were in the pub, the, 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 it was above a pub when it, when it caught fire and burned down. And ever afterwards, Freud, it's hard to tell. I think he liked, people liked, he, he claimed to have dropped the fatal cigarette, but no one quite knows. And I think he quite liked people thinking that he did drop the cigarette. So the school burned to the ground. They had a temporary office. And then it was Paul Odo Cross. Here he is um, uh, on the right uh, with Rosamond Lehman, one of his lovers uh, there in Jamaica where he had a house. Uh, and he came to Cedric's rescue and he lent Cedric the money to buy Benton End. And there's a lovely letter in the Tate. He just, it's 19, um, war has begun. And sorry, he lent him the money. And then in 1942, he writes another letter saying, look, with all this stuff going on, um, just just keep the money. You don't need to repay it. So it's, it was a wonderful act of, of friendship. And uh, he, he, he gave Cedric. Um, it's, it's this plot here. It, it was there's, it'd been separated from the farm. This runs up the hillside. And as said, it's a, you can see um, the, the, the plaster has been taken off. It would have been much more like a manor house when it was built. These would have been fancy crockets. That would have been a second story, but it had been a farmhouse, that, 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 that fine room again. What you see, there's the 16th century chimney, but all of this was reconstructed in the 18th century. And they quite quickly, uh, Ronald Blythe gave all the papers to the Tate. So um, you've got, he was called Mr. Aldous of West Burkholt. You've got an incredibly precise account of what they did for opening the school in 1913, in, in, well, they, in, in, in early 1940, bought in 1939, getting rusty with dates of my age, but the, uh, what, what they did effectively, they made bedrooms in the attic. There are five bedrooms in the attic and up um, 15 students would sleep there. Front door where we saw the pinchbecks, Sarah and Philip, is round here. And this was like the kitchen wing. And the whole of this first floor here was made into a studio. It was ripped out. And then they also put in bathrooms. Downstairs there was a sitting room. So it's a it's a it's a very it's a very pretty house. There's that kitchen again, which was the heart of the house. Um, that's the kitchen today. Uh, it's still um, those steps, the one big change, those steps now go up into a modern kitchen, but they um, they used to go, this is a little painting by John Nash, which was in the big exhibition at the Towner, and they went down into a coal store where Cedric would dry herbs, but also tobacco. He, in the war, he grew his own tobacco for his pipe. And this is the room on the first floor, which has now been partitioned into bedrooms and bathrooms, but we will open back out into this one vast room, which looks out of the valley and out over the garden. And that's, there's a little, that column there, that's where you can see Freud being painted by Cedric Morris. And that's the painting in a, a gallery in Wales. That's, that's Morris's portrait of uh, the young Lucien Freud. Freud painted his portrait in return. What, what Freud got from this was this sense of freedom. Uh, when, when Ernst Freud handed him over to the school, he said, my son is a wild animal. And Cedric was somehow able to give him that freedom. And one thing Freud, Freud, um, we did an exhibition last winter, Lucian Freud, that's our thing. And obviously that's the point of this Benton M project. One point is to have a garden in which artists can work again. This, uh, Freud was the great plant painter of the late 20th century. He, they are, there's, I, I brought a book if anyone wants to, he painted plants all through his life. There's only about 25 of them. He tended to paint them when he didn't want to paint something else. He was depressed after his father's death, when he'd been rejected, but he, and he gets plants. No one else does plants. You, you know, if you think of the great artists of the mid 20th century, they don't do flowers. It's only Freud, a broad statement because of time, but pretty much true. And he gets it from two people. Sigmund, his grandfather was a great gardener. He adored roses, but also from, from, from Morris. And what Morris does when he paints a plant, he gives it independence and stature. So Freud's plant paintings are so good because he can take a tiny house plant and it has the, the stature of a sculpture of something magnificent. And Morris, when he was asked about plant painting, he said, when I see flowers, I don't see prettiness. He said, I see ruthlessness, splendor, sorry, ruthlessness, independence and lust. 
So he saw the plant as a kind of equal, and that's what gives his flowers their status too. It's not this pretty little thing that you can cost it. It's something which has its own life, its own structure, its own agenda in life. Morris understood that plants uh, you know, are doing what they want to do. They have their own, their own trajectory. Redecorating Benton End, um, um, that was called a new limb blue, that bright blue. They painted it pink and orange. Um, this is Cedric. The, the garden was very much designed to be set against these euphorbias, against this orange and blue. Everything was color constructed. Uh, on one side, you sat in the sun, that's let in a black shirt. Um, I like this photograph because I don't know, you really feel you can sort of taste the coffee, can't you? You really, you can be the way you think, you think, ah, that's going to be a delicious pot of coffee. Um, uh, Lett, Lett was the famous cook. I read yesterday, um, he did a t cooking special for Anglia Television. And I just think, oh my, if only that survived, because there's nothing of him to actually find that cooking program somewhere. Um, he was great friends with Elizabeth David. They would exchange recipes and people came and went. Um, everyone had a nickname that was said that Cedric in a chair. He was a Dutchman. Um, I won't, there are too many nicknames. They had so many cats. They loved cats. And there was a little lean to which has been demolished which was called St. Thomas's. Uh, that's where Max was born, wherever he's gone, um, because of all the cats that came out of that, all the cats that were born there. And this is, this is what we're sort of working through. Um, you have all these captions. This is uh, Esther Granger, who taught our Cedric in Wales. They would go to Spain together. Um, this, is, this is them sitting in that kitchen, this, this, this community where um, painting was divided up. That's a lovely painting by Cedric of olive oil, apples from the garden and garlic. This is quite an important thing. This is Cedric's trousers. And when he and Lett quarreled, sometimes they wouldn't speak for weeks and they would leave notes in the pockets. It was um, two, two, so um, in, the, in those trousers there. And again, hanging at one end of the room, there were flower paintings, but this was called Shags and it's an early bird painting. And in the background, you see an oil tanker and they're all covered in oil. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he also did this painting called Landscape of Shame in 1960 which is two years, I think, before Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And that was him reacting to um, chemicals in the, far, in the fields around Benton End. And it's an apocalyptic view of birds killed by those chemicals, which were just dropping out of the sky. He wanted to call it Fizens, but Let said it would be get them sued. So it's called Landscape of Shame, and that's in the Tate. And brought in from the garden, this was a painting, that's that kitchen arch again. This was a painting that belonged to Elizabeth David or was left to her. Um, and, and she, sorry, it was, belonged to Elizabeth David, um, and uh, she gave to the Tate at her death. Here is Lett in his studio, uh, painting, as I said, these futuristic canvases, uh, which um, he's going to be part of the exhibition at Gainsborough's house. And then from the 1960s, a third person joined Benton End, and she was called Millie Hayes. And she had met Cedric in Soho in the 30s. They would all go to Bertarelli's for dinner. Um, I, when I was young, Bert, I don't know, does it still, uh, does it still? I, I remember Bertarelli. So, and um, and uh, she came to Benton End in 1941, married and had a child. And she was diagnosed with what we would now call postnatal depression. And her husband took the child away and she was um, sent to an asylum for the next 15 what would, um, years. All her teeth were taken out and um, Cedric and Lett discovered this and drove down and took her back to Benton End and she became the housekeeper. And Cedric left her enough money in his will to uh, buy a house in Hadley and rather sweetly, in they have a joint tombstone and she's next door in the cemetery in Hadley, but she was the third member. And this is a photograph taken by Richard Morfitt, who Richard knows and who did a great exhibition at the Tate in 1984. Um, he, he met Cedric just in time and had begun work on the exhibition. And this is looking into that kitchen. There's Cedric and there's Millie at the famous cooker, which blew dust everywhere. And she's smoking a cigarette or having a drink. Um, I don't know, I find that um, that's, that's, yeah, Cedric and Millie in 1982. And the other, the, 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 the art was also a celebrate. This is what I mean about giving an epic stature to vegetables and flowers. This is one of, this is a big painting. It's one of his masterpieces. Philip Mould sold it recently, um, says it's one of the great ones. This is a big landscape, cabbages, flowers. In wartime, of course, um, they just dug up the garden for vegetables. Then the irises came, which you saw in the earlier photograph. 
this shows you um this is this became that we're now moving into the garden to finish this became the walled garden and this is um effectively this is the site it's effectively that area there and that's what we're working on reopening uh, in 2026 after a year's work that was very much the the knockout space of the garden this the um just above the road as said vegetables irises that was quite conventional the irises unusual but it could have been many other gardens at its time with these um small box parterres um there was a border just over the wall into the upper garden irises need to be moved every 10 years so we're talking about 50 years of gardening and they then were mixed in to become part of this wider palette of the garden and this obviously sums up what Benton End was all about. You uh, easels put up in the garden. Um, that's, that's I don't know who that was, but at some point I said the bell would ring and you would bring your easel in for supper. And the irises were all named after uh, people in his life. So this is Benton Duff, and that was named after Duff Twisden, who becomes Brett Ashley and the Sun Also Rises, um, uh, the one who uh, Cedric and Lett dance with in Paris. Um, this was named after the Queen mother uh, in honour of something, I forgot, um, uh, an anniversary. Um, Cordelia, I think, was one of the cats or the birds. But as said, there were 90 and Sarah has managed to retrace. I mean, if you, I mean, Sarah opens her garden once or twice a year and it is unbelievable. I mean, and effectively what, what you have is two types of flower. These are artificial, these are works of art. They're cultivars. Cedric is mixing them up like mixing up paints, throwing away 99 out of 100 to keep the ones which really struck him with their, their invigoration of color. There they are, that painting at the Tate. Um, but then otherwise in the garden, he had a pond, he had a, a great rose. This was named by Peter Bills, um, the Cedric Morris Rose. It's a vast rose. They call Peter Bills the gypsy because of his sultry good looks. That was his nickname. Um, then you have people, I quite like this because this is how you dress to visit the garden. She's got her gloves. Um, and but what, what happened? Um, then you have the poppies, and as said, you're moving now into, into species plants. So then it's about wild plants. And Cedric would travel each winter, he would collect, bring seeds back in his luggage, and then he would test what grew. We know um Beth Chateau never actually said right plant, right place. It's always attributed to her, but that was what she was doing, and that's what she got from Cedric. He gave plants freedom, he would move them around, he wanted them to be happy and that seems completely natural now. It's like um, uh, when people talk about Montessori schools, how children should be happy, it seems natural. But at the time it was something new. And what he then did was take out those box beds. At some point in the 1950s, he took out those, um, those, those hedges and did something completely unseen in British gardens. It's the first naturalistic layout. So when you look at the work of Dan Pearson, the work of Pete Aldorf, if you've seen that at say, House and Birth in Somerset, that is a contemporary style. Cedric did it first. Yes, he kept the main part, but he effectively, we don't call them island beds because that, that feels like something else with a shrub in the middle. He basically, um, he seems to have been inspired by alpine meadows. It's as if he was trying to recreate a natural habitat and he wanted you to wander through the, through the plants also, of course, set up for painting. There are lots of places to put your easel, but it's the first naturalistic garden in Britain and it happened in the 1950s. And there are hundreds of photographs um, showing how that, I don't, I don't think it comes across particularly well in photographs. It's much more about little compositions for art, for paintings. Um, many artist gardens are like that. They don't, don't photograph well. They're about these little scenes. Um, Anthony Iton, who lives in Brixton, 99 years old, garden, isn't a design garden, but it's full of these little vignettes that he can sit and paint. So that looks quite scruffy, but Cedric would have got a painting out of that. And what startled people at the time was all these bare spaces, leaving bits bare. And I, I you know, I, I imagine that that is explicable owing to Cedric spent his whole life doing whatever he wanted. He did what he wanted, he didn't defer, and he made the garden as he wanted it to be. And there he is standing. And, and it would have been a question of kneeling down and peering at those little flowers. Um, that's, I only put that in because I always want someone to spot who this person is. I call him Suffolk's Lankiest Man, and I want someone to try to, trying to, hopefully someone, we're trying to spot all these people in the photographs. 
as said, that's the that's the site, and we are working on renewing the lower garden. Um, here's yeah, Cedric at the end of his life, and um, from the 1970s, the school really did start to peter out. He was joined by somebody called Frances Mount, who's still alive, and she said at the very end he had macular degeneration. He could still identify birds high up in the sky, but he had to be helped as he weeded because it could be an incredibly precious plant he'd brought back from a trip to Portugal. And he had to be gently helped so he didn't pull out the wrong things. And Ronald Blythe, who wrote that essay called The Iris Master, said that it was a, um, he said, Cedric was like, he said he lived completely in the present. He was like a cat and he just lay in the garden. He says it was like a, a haze of wild plants, which I think, and that's how the garden ended. It had become a kind of, so he said a meadow of exotics, all these rare precious plants becoming one great meadow. Um, so I love pictures of Cedric. And um, that is, uh, that's, uh, I guess, the early 1970s. That's Cedric just before he died. And that is, and Glyn Morgan said, he went back each summer and he said, he never left without tears in his eyes. He said, it, he said the house, he said the rooms felt twice their size. And he said, the, the charm he says was that Cedric was utterly selfish, supported by Laird, but he did what he wanted. Painting was what mattered. And he said that as long as you worked hard and had good manners, then everyone fitted in, which is a nice way of, of, of living. But I think, and Maggie said that she had, we're just going to finish with the flowers in the garden today. Maggie Hambling won an art prize at school. She was 15 and it was called the artist house and it was slightly dangerous. Um, they were openly gay. It was important to remember that homosexuality wasn't illegal when they arrived, but homosexual act, acts were. They, um, uh, it, it was this, you know, this, as I said, that, that dangerous whiff of garlic, but she was too shy to knock on the door. And sort of, then she did knock on the door and let, well, let and Cedric welcomed her into the kitchen, put her sketches on top of um, a radiator. Sounds unlikely. I think there's one over here, it was freezing cold on top of something. And she said that was the formative night of her life. And what Let said to her, he said, whatever you do, your art must always be your best friend to be an artist. Lovers, relationships come and go. It's your art that must be your best friend. And um, you can ask questions, you know, part of this um, revival, um, we had a, a garden in support of Benton End at the Chelsea Flower Show this year, designed by Sarah Price. Um, it, it was astonishing, both in 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 that what Sarah was trying to do was, it's her garden, it's not a homage to Cedric, was to try and come up with some of those colour combinations that Cedric achieved, but also to try and come up with quite, quite daring for Chelsea, lots of that. You came, didn't you, Pat? Did, 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 yeah, yeah, he was one of them on that beautiful night. It was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and coming up with these sort of rough patches of soil uh, with the plants scattered through them. And those plants, apart from the tree, are all going back to Benton End. Um, that's it across the valley. And we had, um, these are some photographs to finish from Matt Collins, who's our head gardener at the museum. And when lockdown came, he was about to set off um, on a trip around Europe with his, Clemmy, his wife and their, their, their young baby. And they wanted a change, you know, a, a, an adventure. So we said, why didn't you go and live at Benton End? Because it's empty. And they lived in a coach house, but Matt, who writes, he just won Garden Writer of the Year had a room up in the attic and uh, he spent, he said, I lived there for exactly a year. He wrote a beautiful piece about it in The Guardian. And that's what Benton then is all about, is are these, it's as much about life as about art, about journeys, about reflection, about finding your path. And these are just one of the joys. When, when I first looked over the wall all that time ago with Andrew Lambert, the art writer, he said, there's nothing left, nothing left, it's all gone. But what's been quite special is that many, a few of the shrubs, some of the trees like that medlar survive. But it is something of a miracle because it had four owners and none of them redesigned it. A single digger could have come in and ripped this out in an afternoon or a couple of afternoons. But what in particular survived was Cedric's bulbs and um, bulbs he very often had brought back from those winter trips to the Mediterranean. Um, and these are just some of Matt's photographs, the Culturecum named after Cedric, the snowdrops out now. Um, skip, that's the Utterbar Garden, which was still very much left as the orchard. That's a pear tree. This was um, a corridor, that's corridors beneath the medlar. Um, and that 
they have come back and this is a painting called Chig Chaff. Um, I'm not, I know nothing about plant names, so Matt has very kindly done this for me today. Because it's my, and what's lovely is you can see a collection of spring flowers in that painting. That was a particular fertility called an aloof fertility in Cedric's words. Um, you see um, that's Acma petal, the tall one with branches over. And I'm going to show you these flowers in the next few pictures. That's there. That's really beautiful. It's like this big. You have to get life out on the ground to see it. And I think you get a sense of Cedric's eye for plants. They were, they were, as I said, they were they were species plants. They were uncultivated, unbred by man, but they were all very delicate, strong colours. Um, that's quite famous now. The snakes had fertility. He had, and he was one of the first people to naturalise fertility. I've grown that in window boxes. It's quite easy. But he was one of the first people to. Um, as I said, naturalize them in the grass. And this is what's coming back today. That's a rare narcissus he would have brought back from one of his trips. That's a really beautiful anemone. It's tiny again, you really have to get your nose in the grass. And I hope from that, that's that's better knowing uh, that's a big blousy fertility. Again, he would have brought that, that, that's spreading all up the garden. He would have brought that bulb back from Turkey. And um, that's a much rarer fertility, which is, uh, really beautiful another one that's the, the one looping over the top and i think these are still pretty unusual plants and that's this and then um clearing the meadow and then um we have a very talented head gardener called james horner who has finished the first year who was a star pupil of great dixter and he's continuing this project and it's about repatriating the plants. So people are sending plants back to Benton End like from the Snowdrop Nursery and we're reassembling the, the flowers as the first stage. And this is um, the sweet pea. Um, Cedric gave some seed to Tony Venison, the gardens writer at Country Life. He gave the seed to a friend who gave it to Dan Pearson, who gave it to us. So that seed that Cedric would have collected in Sicily, there it's regarded as a weed, it grows by the roadside. And that some of those uh, sweet peas come back to, to Benton End. So it's a lovely thing, the idea that a place can come back to life because of the strength of people's personality. And Cedric tore up photographs of himself when he was old. When he was, he had photographs of himself when he was young and he tore them up when he was old. He left very few instructions. He somehow, apart from appointing a plant executor, he somehow let posterity look after himself itself, which is a dangerous thing to do but he somehow left something which is all uh, coming back up because of that, 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 that strength of art and living. So thank you very much.